Hello everyone and welcome back to Badminton Weekly with me, Jasmine Lim. Although it may sport a new look, the highly anticipated Yonex All England Open Badminton Championships once again treated us to a week filled of top-level action. From controversial moments to history-making runs, there's plenty to discuss and I'm delighted to have Scotland's number one player, Kirsty Gilmer, joining us today. Thanks for being here, Kirsty. Super happy to be back. Thanks for having me. It's been a while, but Indonesian fans had plenty to celebrate as they walked away with two titles. Their first came after an all-Indonesia showdown saw Jonathan Christie take down Anthony Sinisuka Ginting. With how Christie started the year, were you surprised that it was him at the top step of the podium at the end of the day? I think people that have been following badminton for a while are no strangers to Jonathan Christie's quality. Although we haven't really seen it this year so far. So it's a little surprising going on current form, but on the top level badminton that we know Jonathan Christie has, then it's not really a surprise because he's always capable of these big wins. So coming into the tournament completely unseeded um, and then having to play like a big name in every single round. So going into the final, he would have been tired, but like excited about, you know, making it that far. And then going up against Ginting, a player that he obviously knows so, so well, um, I guess it just came down to who had it on the day and, and Jonathan Christie had that edge and he, he did it quite convincingly. I think he played with a lot of freedom and tactically I think that looked like containing Ginting in the front court and then finding those spaces in the, in the deep back corners um, and not allowing uh, Ginting those kind of really open, stretchy rallies. I think he managed to keep it quite contained uh, and, and that might have been the secret on the day. Uh, and of course, in getting this title, it means he has a title at every single World Tour level, which is also another incredible achievement. We made a uh, history again after 30 years, all in recent final. That it's very meaningful for me, for Indonesian men singles. Doesn't matter who win uh, today. I'm just very happy to meet uh, his story again with Anthony, with uh, Indonesian men single. It's just enough for me. Indonesia's second title came after Fajal Afian and Mohamed Rian Adianto successfully defended their crown, overcoming Malaysia's Aaron Chia and So Ik. Coincidentally, this victory marks their first title since their All England win last year. It has been a long time coming, but they can't ask for a better time to get back to winning ways, can they? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there must be something in the water in Birmingham for them. You know, if you're going to pick a tournament to win on the tournament calendar, All England is probably going to rank quite highly. But uh, they, had a, they had a fairly convincing tournament, uh, you know, like all two sets apart from, I think, their second round against the Japanese pair, uh, Kaigo and Seiko. So going into the final, I think they would have been feeling pretty confident. But I think what set the pairs apart in the, in the match I think we saw it was a really tight like service situation game. It was the first four shots in that game where were where the game was really won and lost. We didn't see many like opening out rallies and I think the Malaysians play better on that kind of big court with with more spaces, but the Indonesians did such a good job of keeping it tight, flat and fast and it it, it saw them grab that victory. Now, there was a controversial moment when Anthony Ginting took on Victor Axelsson in the quarterfinals. A crucial point in the deciding game that Ginting won sparked plenty of debate online, with some saying it should have been a foul instead. Here is Chris Langridge who was on-site in Birmingham sharing his thoughts on the incident and perhaps a solution that could help prevent such moments in the future. So I think it's, it's a really complicated one because for me the biggest thing I think hopefully that might come from it is trying to assist the umpires to almost give them an extra way of being, if they're not sure they can almost go to a slow-mo replay, they can almost ask for assistance because if we're honest when it's that quick, it's so hard to call. It could have been a centimetre over, centimetre not. Now, we're lucky that we have Hawkeye for a line call, which is really helpful because although the line judges do a great job, occasionally they get it wrong. And I think something like that, we, I've been thinking it for a little bit. You know, it's so close to the net. Also, sometimes you can't tell when someone touches the net. And these are minor, minor, minor differences, but they make such a big difference to the game. You know, obviously we can't go back in time, but if we could, could have had a different outcome, quite possibly. Um, and I think it would be great to aid the umpires. I've sat in the umpire's chair once, and it was horrible. You know, it is a tough job. I didn't umpire a game, I just sat up there and tried to watch, and 
it's hard. You know, it's much harder than anticipated. And I think they need that support sometimes. They can almost, you know, put their hand up and ask for assistance in some way. It's a Hawkeye equivalent for uh, if it touches the net or if the racket's over or, you know, something like, even if it touches the ground, sometimes it's so hard to tell. Despite her French Open setback a few weeks ago, Carolina Marin proved once again she's never to be underestimated on the big stage. Sharing that she wasn't at the best place at the start of the week, the Spaniard's determination and fighting spirit was still evident on her way to the second All England title, weren't they? Absolutely, I think this has been an incredible week for Carolina. Um, I think she kind of flew under the radar all week. You know, people are used to seeing the big four in the semis. So I think there might have been a little bit of pressure off of her and she's just quietly made her way through the, well, not quietly because it's Carolina, but she's made her way through the rounds and, you know, find herself in the final. And I mean, such a shame in the final that we didn't get the full two sets or, or potentially three sets. But uh, I think Yamaguchi maybe told herself that she could go all in in the first set and see where she was, and she was so close. Fair play to Carolina, she didn't for a second think that that was over. So I think in terms of that game, I think Carolina was acutely aware of how tough the uh, Yamaguchi semi-final had been. And I think the tactic may have been to not bowl her over with speed and power and quick rallies. I think the tactic might have been to drag this out as long as possible and just have the full confidence in her own physical capabilities that she could do that for three sets, whereas she didn't know if Yamaguchi could hang on for that long. So, hey, smart tactics from the Spanish camp. It was really important just to keep fighting until the end. As I said yesterday, if um, I knew that it's going to be top game, but um, if she wanted to beat me, she really needed to do harder. So even when she was leading in the first game, I, want, I didn't want to, to think about the score. I wanted to just keep going on core, uh, you know, to move her around, to just uh, do one more point. And um, this is what I w wanted to keep the focus. interest from fans and players alike. And in its 125th edition, the tournament garnered even more attention after it underwent a significant transformation. We're of course talking about the never-before-seen grey courts. Let's hear from the tournament representatives as they share the reason behind the colour grey, as well as hear from the players themselves after they experienced it for the first time. This is all about being a point of difference. Every other Super 1000 for many years has done great green courts and different coloured surrounds. We are going to look very, very different. We're grey, we've got a black surround and it is going to be a massive point of difference. When you look at a, a, a match in the future, you're immediately going to know this is the Yonex All England with our amazing grey courts. And this is an opportunity for the players to see that we're continuing to innovate, we're continuing to be different, and we want to keep pushing those boundaries. We want to create a festival of badminton that fans all over the world can enjoy, whether they're here in the venue or whether they're looking at it on TV. We have been discussing quite a lot together with Badminton England for like four years or five years. 
um, how we can like elevate the games and how we can engage with fans all over the world. Um, we wanted to make the as like athlete is the the hero of the tournaments. Um, as you can see um, on the great court mats, you can feel more like movements and like more shadows, how it's moving. Everything's pips up. I think that's so the great word. It's definitely really cool. It's really trippy. Uh, like sometimes I feel like am I in a in a filter? But it, it is something new. All England, Yonix, they always do something unique at every All England and it's very creative. So I, I don't mind it. It's just really cool. Oh, she's a little bit different. But the 회색을 좋아하기는 하는데 이제 배드민턴에 이렇게 적용을 하니까 조금 저희 저한테는 좀안 좋은 것 같아요. 눈이 좀 앞서긴 하더라고요. 꽃은 흰, 셔틀 꽃이 흰색이다 보니까 이게 잘 배치가 되지 않아서 좀 어려운 것 같습니다. It's special. I mean, it's my first time as well, and I hope can it can change uh, many kind of color every year. Maybe, yeah. The calendar continues this week in Basel for the Yonex Swiss Open. And there's plenty at stake for players like Christo Popov, who continues his very close fight with brother Toma Jr. for the coveted spot in the games. Christo's recent milestone achievement in Birmingham, where he became the first Frenchman to reach the semi finals, has of course bolstered his position, and it seems increasingly likely that the spot will go to him at the end of the race to Paris. I think what Christo and Toma have been doing over the last couple of years is it's almost unique to our sport. Um, it's well, definitely unique within the last kind of five years, um, when the kind of five, ten years when the physicality of singles has really taken off and we've seen almost no one bridge the gap between being a singles player and doubles player at the same time. So like you say, we can see Crystal kind of pulling away now um, in terms of ranking and in terms of recent performances, absolutely no slight or shame to Tommy. He is also an incredible player, but we do, we haven't seen that real upwards trajectory of of performances. So, I mean, it's been such an interesting journey so far to watch them go along with that together. Um, but yes, I don't know if anyone could have predicted that we would see the gap happening now. I think. People might have thought that that would be more apparent sooner, um, but it's so it's been such an interesting side-by-side -side battle until, what are we, four or five weeks away from the end of Olympic qualifying? So, yeah, I think what they've managed to do is incredible and it's been super, super fun to watch and, and kind of be a part of. PV Sindhu is another to keep an eye on in Basel. She's been looking good since her return to the tour, reaching the third round at the French Open and following that up with a second round appearance in Birmingham. Kirsty, do you think that she's almost back to a comfortable level? I think when PV Sindhu was coming back from her injury, I think she honestly struggled to get back up to, up to the pace of Lady Singles at that point. It could have been that physically she wasn't, you know, back up to speed, um, or it was the kind of the competition of it, and you know, getting back into the groove of everything after taking some time off or time away due to the injury. Um, but I think we can see old Sindhu coming back. There's there's glimmers of the 2019 uh, World Championship. Uh, winning Sindhu um, coming back and I think she's finding out in this kind of this it is almost it feels kind of like a new era of women singles um, I think she's finding out her place in that and it's still an incredibly high level um, but uh, she's clearly showing that that same quality against the ones that are you know top four top eight right now and just due to her style and her power I think she can still, I think she's got some some big performances left in her, for sure. Thanks so much, Kirsty, for taking the time to join us today. And unfortunately, that is all the time we have for this week's show. We hope to see you again real soon. Thanks for having me. See you next time. 
As mentioned, catch all the action from Basel for the fourth Super 300 event of the calendar, the Yonex Swiss Open, happening from the 19th of March all the way through to the 24th. If you're on the go, catch the latest news, match highlights and statistics on the BDRF app, Badminton for You. And before we go, let us know your thoughts on the grey courts of the All England and what other colours you think would be great for future tournaments on our Facebook and YouTube pages. Until next week everyone, take care and goodbye!